Good evening, everyone. My name is Naomi Hausman. I'm the Director of Institutional Advancement at Gratz College. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, thank you for joining us for tonight's lecture with Dr. Derek Pensler, the William Lee Frost Professor of Jewish History at Harvard University. Tonight's lecture is named in memory of Rabbi Admiral Aaron Landis, a Jewish admiral who was the nation's second rabbi to head the clergy corps in the US Navy. For over 35 years, he was also the rabbi of Congregation Beth Shalom, located just down the street from Gratz College, and served for many years on the Gratz Board of Governors. His wife, Sora Landis, also a pillar, also a pillar of our community, is a Gratz alumna and founding principal of the Foreman Center of the Perlman Jewish Day School in Greater Philadelphia. The Landis Lecture is made possible through the generosity of Bryna and Joshua Landis and the Landis family. So please join me in thanking the entire family for their generosity and commitment to Gratz. Before we get started, a few important notes about tonight's program. There will be an opportunity to engage in a Q&A in the latter portion of the program. So please feel free to share any questions or comments in that Q&A toolbar uh, on your Zoom tool that, toolbar. Uh, and just know that only the moderators and presenters will see uh, questions and comments that you enter there. Uh, the program will be recorded tonight and we'll share that recording with everybody who registered for the program. If you, uh, this is also the third and final uh, installment of the Landis Lecture Series for 2022. So if you didn't have the pleasure of joining us for the prior two lectures uh, in uh, February, January and February, I invite you to visit uh, our YouTube channel where you can find uh, recordings of those other lectures. They were uh, absolutely wonderful as well. So now it is my great pleasure to, uh, to introduce Dr. Paul Finkelman, uh, the Gratz College Chancellor and Distinguished Professor of History. Dr. Phil Finkelman, welcome. Thank you very much. And it's a delight to be here. And it is a great honor to introduce uh, Derek Pensler uh, to the Gratz community. Um, I first encountered Derek when I read his incredibly wonderful book, Jews in the Military a History, which he published about a decade ago. And uh, like many academics, I read lots of books and I rarely read a book where I want to get copies of it and give it to people, but I did uh, because it was a great book. It's a terrific book. And uh, Derek is a great scholar. His uh, resume came to me last week by bulk mail. Uh, it um, goes on for page after page after page. Uh, I could read it all and then we wouldn't have time for him to talk. Uh, he did his undergraduate degree at Stanford. He did a PhD at Cal Berkeley. Um, he has taught at Indiana University, the University of Toronto, Oxford University, uh, and he is currently uh, the William Lee Frost Professor of Jewish History at Harvard University. He has also taught uh, in France, in Israel, um, and uh, lectured literally around the world. Uh, he is the author of 11 books, at least 50 scholarly articles. Uh, he is a fellow of St. Anne's College of Oxford. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. And in general, he is a scholar scholar and someone who has made an enormous impact on our understanding of the history of Jews um, over a very long period of time. And again, what blows me away about his work is that it is not time bound. It is expansive. It goes from one period to another period to another period. And um, it's breathtaking. And with that in mind, I would be delighted to turn the program over to uh, my new best friend, uh, Derek Pensler. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Finkelman, for that uh, extremely warm introduction. I um, don't quite know if I can live up to that. And thank you to, to Naomi Hausman for, um, uh, for your help in getting this all together. And of course, I want to thank the, um, the Landis family for making this lecture series possible. And the fact that it is uh, a lecture series in memory of uh, the Rabbi Admiral Aaron Landis, uh, you know, a very important pioneering figure in the military chaplaincy, Jewish military chaplaincy in the United States. This makes this particular evening all the more, all the more uh, dear to me. So thank you very much. Now, what I'd like to do is share my screen, which takes just a little bit of work. It'll take just a second. It's something, it's something I can do in advance. 
So there's just going to be a little bit of um, back and forth here until I get things launched. And then hopefully everything will be okay. I'm just going to launch it and then we should be in business. So um, Naomi or anyone else, if you don't see this, let me know. I'm not hearing anything. You're, you're, you're good, Dr. Pensler. I'm good. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so um, this is a talk about the meaning of military service for Jews in the modern world, and particularly the idea of fighting for rights. That, um, of course, rights aren't something that should be fought for. Rights are something that one simply should receive by being a human being. But for members of oppressed minorities, throughout modern history, there's been a very common idea that if one fights for the country that has oppressed a community, that the majority, the dominant culture, will then recognize the sacrifices made by that minority and will accord them the rights that, of course, they should have had all along simply by being human beings. Now, I've worked on this with reference to Jews throughout the world. I have colleagues who have worked on this phenomenon with reference to, say, Black Americans in World War I and in World War II. Uh, there are people who have worked on this for Japanese Americans during the Second World War, Native Americans during the Second World War. I mean, the list goes on and on of groups that believe that by fighting and dying, often above their numbers, fighting with particular gallantry, that they will win social acceptance. Sometimes it works. Um, often it doesn't. And tonight we're going to talk about the case of Jewish history to see what of this aspect of fighting for rights actually helped get Jews emancipation and what didn't. And what I'm talking about is a certain type of soldier that was an ideal from the late 1700s, really up until the mid 20th century, maybe the era of Vietnam was the end of it. The idea of a citizen soldier, the idea that by being part of the country in which you live, you have certain obligations and those obligations include military service. So the citizen soldier was something different from say a volunteer, although the volunteer soldier is also a kind of romantic type in, 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 in history. A conscript is something different. Everybody has to serve as the ideal. Now this is a very gendered concept because historically military service has been overwhelmingly limited to men. And I understand there have been differences. The state of Israel has conscripted women from the very beginning. The United States has an all volunteer army in which women um, serve alongside of men. But if we look at the grand scheme of history, then the language about citizenship and the language about military service is intertwined and it's intertwined in a way that obviously favors males because males are seen as the ones who will fight and die for the country. Well, there's a Yiddish proverb, as with Christians, so with Jews. In other words, if Jews went into armies in modern history, most often it's because they were drafted. It's not because they volunteered, it's because they had to go. But nonetheless, whether they volunteered or were drafted, the Jewish community broadly understood, rabbis, Jewish journalists, Jewish educators, people who speak for the Jewish community, saw in the Jewish soldier going into battle a symbol of Jewish pride, a counter, a response to anti-Semites, proof that Jews are not cowardly, that they are brave, that they are virtuous, and that they um, fully deserve citizenship. Now, I'm going to focus in my talk this evening really on one part of the world. I'm going to focus on Western Europe, France, Germany, Austria, Italy. You might say, well, why not the United States? Why not the United Kingdom? Why not Russia? Well, in Russia, the Jews aren't emancipated. They're not emancipated really until 1917 with the Bolshevik Revolution. So there's there's no notion in at least the Soviet mentality of 1917 that Jews have proven themselves in some way. Now, there were Jews in the Russian army who tried to prove themselves decade after decade. That didn't get them emancipation. And then the opposite side of the story is the United States. And I understand that the audience, all of you out there tonight, you're probably more aware of, more familiar with the United States, obviously, than any other country. Well, the case of the United States is one in which the military, really until World War I, the military was not a permanent institution. Obviously, the United States had its wars. But throughout the 1800s, early 1900s, the US military was with a couple of 
very powerful exceptions, really a small frontier force. The US Civil War is a different story and Jews fought in the US Civil War. But really until the First World War, the United States Army didn't have the kind of power, it didn't have the kind of prestige or status that the army had say in France or in the German states or in Italy or the Habsburg Empire. It's a very different story in the United States. And although Jews always faced anti-Semitism in the United States, and there were Jews who argued that military service proved Jewish bravery, it did not have the same central meaning that it had in countries like France, Italy, Germany, or the Habsburg Empire, nor did it really matter that much in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom had a very small military, a very small army, really until the First World War. It had the Royal Navy. And what kind of people went into the Royal Navy? I mean, uh, poor people, down and out people would volunteer, and then you had aristocratic officers. The army was very small and very low prestige. So if we want to understand where Jews think that they need to volunteer or gladly go when they're called up to serve their country to win rights, we're best off focusing on, on Europe. So I'm going to talk about this for about half an hour. And I will make some parallels at the end to the United States. So we'll see the, we'll see the differences. Now, where does it start? The idea in a continent that had oppressed Jews for centuries, ghettoized them, limited their occupations, subjected them to periodic violent persecutions. How did it happen that by the late 1700s, at least some enlightened Europeans are thinking that the Jews deserve to be included into society? And it actually has a lot to do with the military. This gentleman, a French Protestant named Jacques Banage, wrote one of the first comprehensive histories of the Jews, not written by a Jew, interestingly enough, written by a French Protestant. He devotes a lot of attention to the virtue and the valor and the honor of the Jews, claiming that the Jews have always been a valorous people fighting in the civic guard in early medieval France or in late medieval Portugal or in Poland in the 1600s. He even writes uh, something that Jewish writers also were quite proud of, that in Prague in 1648, when Prague was being besieged by Swedes during the Thirty Years' War, I'm quoting Banage, they were so glorious and zealous for glory that they gained that one of their rabbis, Rabbi Judeon, wrote the history of the siege to teach posterity of the services the Jews had rendered it. And I've read this little book written by Rabbi Jude Leon. It's called Sefer Milchama Bashalom, the book of war in peace, not war and peace, which is Tolstoy, but war in peace. And it is a, uh, uh, a statement of the um, service that Jews performed to the people of, of Prague. And you begin to see throughout the 1700s, individuals in France and the German lands beginning to write um, books in Latin or in German or in French, uh, that they, the Jews are not a people without, without honor and that they do have qualities that are beneficial for a modern state. And this culminated in a couple of very important books. So here we see a book written by a German bureaucrat in the late 1700s called On the Civil Improvement of the Jews. He was a bureaucrat. His job was how to make the state economically, politically, militarily stronger. And he says, you know, we have this group in society that we have marginalized. Let's include them into the state. Let's allow them to take a variety of occupations. Let's bring them into the military. And they will perform admirably as they have in the past. So this notion that history provides a guarantee that Jews have been warriors in the past, and they will be warriors again. This book was very influential in the German-speaking world, as was this little book in France, published right before the French Revolution broke out by Henri Baptiste Grégoire. He was a um, secular Catholic leader, and he wrote a book called An Essay on the Physical, Moral, and Political Regeneration of the Jews, in which he says the Jews were once a bellicose nation now possessed of a germ of valor. They still have it. They still have that ability, but it needs to be brought out. So how and when were Jews actually drafted? When did they first go into the army? Well, it's a strange story. 
um, and not a very familiar one. The first country to draft Jews was the Austrian Empire or the Habsburg Empire. And it was this man here, Joseph II, um, Holy Roman Emperor from 1765 to 1790, who gets an idea in the late 1780s that as a matter of principle, Jews should provide military service to the state. And he, by the way, issued a whole series of decrees around the same time, allowing Jews access to education, greater access to occupation. So you see the connection between conscription and the idea that Jews can be integrated uh, into the state. Now, what he does, he doesn't actually draft Jews as soldiers. He drafts them to be like transport core, uh, support personnel. And this is something that other countries do as well in the 1800s. But the fact is, eventually, they do wind up fighting. There were about 15,000 Jews in the Habsburg military um, in the early 1800s. There were 35,000 during the wars against um, Napoleon. Now, how would Jews react to this? Well, there were Jews who themselves were reformers, who wanted Jews to integrate into the modern state, and such Jews praised the conscription of Jews as a sign that they will be welcomed into the modern, the modern world. But what if you're a traditional Jew? What if you're, say, a traditional rabbi? The traditional, um, oops, the traditional Jewish view of Gentile authority is that it is to be respected but suspected as in Fiddler on the Roof, when the rabbi is asked, is there a blessing for the czar? And the rabbi says, of course, may God bless and keep the czar far away from us. So in the Jewish tradition, Gentile authority is something to be kept at a distance. And the Jews, the idea is, live their own separate lives. They pay taxes to the authorities. They do not serve in Gentile wars. But what happens when the Jews are conscripted? It's, it's an order from the state. And there is a rabbinic concept in the Talmud called Dina de Malguta Dina, or the law of the land is law, that unless the king or the sovereign decrees something which is clearly a violation of Jewish law, there are certain, certain things that no Jew should be allowed to or should have to um, transgress, even under the pain of their own death. But short of that, the idea is that you follow the law. So this presented the chief rabbi of Prague, a truly great figure, Yechezkel Landau, with a terrible dilemma. And there's a story that he that, 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 that is, is amazing. It's quite heartrending. So it's April of 1789. 25 Jews in Prague have been called up, and they have to go off to service. And they're, they're gathered in the, the, uh, the old um, square, the town square in old Prague. And the rabbi gives them a speech. It's a beautiful speech, which was transcribed and reprinted. He gives each recruit a sidur, a prayer book, and a packet of tzitzit, uh, and a pair of tefillin. And he says to them, and I'm just going to quote, go forth to your fate, follow it without protest, obey your superiors, be loyal out of duty and patient out of obedience, but forget ye not your religion. Do not be ashamed to be Yehudim among, among so many Christians. Pray to God daily as soon as you awake, for prayer to God comes before all. He tells them, try to avoid prohibited foods. You know, don't eat any meat that's offered to you. Live on eggs and, and butter and cheese, which, by the way, means there was no concept of whole of Yisrael. It was totally fine for Jews to make, uh, to eat dairy products that have been uh, pr uh, produced by Gentiles. Um, and the rabbi claims, he says, um, earn for yourselves and our entire nation gratitude and honor so that one may see that our nation loves its ruler and state authority and in case of need, be prepared to give up your life. Now, does he mean this? He's saying to these Jews, go off into battle, fight for your emperor, make us proud, Try to stay observant. Okay. Well, he gave the speech in German because that's the language that the draft authority, that the military authorities who were right next, you know, right next to him would have understood. But in private, actually, in private, right after giving this speech, he sent a petition to the, uh, or shortly after the emperor died, and he sent a petition to the new emperor saying, could you please 
exempt the Jews from military service. So it's not like he ran into this enthusiastically. It was a last resort that Jews must follow royal authority, but he begged and pleaded with the emperor to exempt the Jews, which wasn't the case. This tension between obeying the law of the land and trying to maintain the Jews as separate. Just think about it. What a terrible threat this is to the survival of a Jew as an Orthodox Jew. It's not just the dietary laws. And the keeping of the Sabbath and the celebration of the holidays and who knows what kind of you know, immoral behavior that might come from being in the army. And we see this in the writings of this rabbi, Rabbi Moses Sofer, otherwise known as the Chatam Sofer, who lived in what is today, um, um, uh, well, he lived in today's Slovakia, in the city of Bratislava. And he, he wrote conscriptions like taxation. You know, we Jews pay tax. So if we get conscripted, we have to go. But he says, if you have the chance to buy your way out of service legally, do it. And the fact is that often you could buy a substitute um, in 19th century Europe. You could pay someone else, basically, to fight for you if you were drafted. Now, this means that in Judaism, there was a real reluctance to go into the military, not a prohibition, but a reluctance. And in that sense, Jews were a little different from some Christian sects in Europe. Um, Mennonites and various what are called Anabaptists, so this is a radical form of Protestantism that is completely doctrinally pacifist. Judaism is not a pacifistic religion. There have been very few Jewish conscientious objectors in wars in history. In certain branches of Christianity, no matter how much you hate someone, you may not lay you know, a hand on them. In the Jewish tradition, it was more a desire to maintain a separate Jewish life, a separate Jewish um, community that made Jews reluctant to go into the military. So much so that when Jews were conscripted and a conscription gang went into the old square here in the city of uh, what is today Lviv in Western Ukraine, or Lvov in Yiddish or Lemberg in German, Jews attacked them with, with clubs uh, because they didn't want to be drafted. So we see here the tension between a traditional Jewish life and the needs of the modern state. Now in other countries in Europe, Jews were more willing to serve, particularly because they were offered, um, well, they were offered incentives. They were offered, say, emancipation. But the main thing to understand is that in general, whoops, um, even in the 1800s in Europe, when there was conscription in every major European country, it wasn't universal. Until the late 1800s, you could often buy your way out of, out of service. So conscription wasn't really all that universal. And there were lots of people who did not want to go into battle. It wasn't just Jews. Lots and lots of men did not want to go into battle. In Germany, middle-class Germans, for example, they would um, cut off their trigger fingers to avoid getting conscripted. They would starve themselves and drink lots of coffee to induce tachycardia so that when the army doctor listened to their heart, you know, they would be proclaimed unfit for service. German peasants did not want their kids going into the army because they would lose a farmhand. So there were lots and lots of people who did not want to go into the military in the 1800s, and that included a fair number of, um, of Jews. It's true that there were many cases of Jews trying to avoid the draft. Here we see a military recruiting um, um, uh, group coming into a, a Jewish shtetl to, to take Jews into military service. But I did some research on this, and I found that, yes, there were Jews who refused to show up for recruitment, but there were so many Poles and Ukrainians and Italians and other people in Europe who didn't want to show up either that... I mean, I can't say that the Jewish no-show rates were higher than those for any other ethnic group. They were probably lower than, um, for example, the, the highest no-show rates in the Austrian Empire were in the Italian territories. So yes, of course, Jews often try to dodge the draft, but this is not unique to Jews. And I say this because anti-Semites have insisted that Jews are you know, uniquely cowardly or unwilling to fight for their country. It's not true. Um, I think this was actually a very widespread, um, widespread phenomenon. Also, a lot of Jews were too ill to serve, and that was true for Poles and 
uh, poor Ukrainians. I mean, the fact is that something like a quarter of all Polish men in the late 1800s were not even five foot one. They were so malnourished, right, that they, they, they were so stunted in their growth. So a lot of um, Jews and, and non-Jews in Central and Eastern Europe, they had eye diseases, they had all kinds of deformities. So actually, the number of people who went into the military, Jews included, was fairly small. But there was an ideal an ideal that more prosperous Jews, middle-class Jews, educated Jews spread. It was an ideal that goes back to the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, that every man should be a citizen by duty and no man should be a soldier by trade. You know, that everyone should fight. And in real life, maybe that wasn't the case, but it was an ideal through the 19th century as conscription slowly became more and more universal. Finally, by the late 1800s, you couldn't buy your way out of service. And with this language of the ideal of military service, Jews were called upon to serve as well. And um, it had real meaning. For example, just a moment, here we go. In Germany, during the Napoleonic Wars, hundreds of middle-class Jews, you know, fairly well off, volunteered to fight as what were called Freikorps. They volunteered to fight against um, Napoleon. They had the money to get themselves uniform and weapons. They were promoted in the field. They did not have to convert to promote, to get promoted. They received iron crosses. Um, something similar happened in, in, in France. I mean, very early in the French Revolution, there was a debate about this in the Chamber of Deputies. Let's see where the Chamber of Deputies went. Just a moment, there it is. In the French Chamber of Deputies, there was a debate about the Jews and the military. And one French deputy said, I do not know of any general in the world who would wish to command an army of Jews on the Sabbath day. The idea being the Jews won't fight on the Sabbath. Therefore, they shouldn't be in the army and we shouldn't make them citizens either. But the Jews then wrote a response to the French Chamber of Deputies saying, Jews are always ready to spill blood for the glory of the nation and the preservation of liberty. And just as in Prussia, Jews rushed to volunteer for civic guards and for other forms of military service. Um, so it's a minority of middle-class, educated, fairly well-off Jews who have imbibed the spirit of modern patriotism. And the masses of Jews are, are indifferent, just as the masses of the population in general are indifferent. So this happens in the French, uh, during the period of the French Revolution. It happens in Prussia. We even see this amazing diary uh, written by a, a German Jew who fights against Napoleon. Um, my heart pounded with joy. I was so thankful to be able to prove myself uh, you know, to, to, to the fatherland. So this is the spirit for a minority, but a very vocal and prominent minority of, of Jews. In fact, there was one celebrated Orthodox rabbi in Metz, which is northeastern France, who shaved his beard so that he could be in his unit. There was a rule, you couldn't have a beard. He just shaved his beard. So he's not acting like Moses Sofer or Yechezkel Landau saying, you know, keep your customs. He's saying, forget it, I'll get rid of my beard. I don't mind, I want to fight. So this was the spirit of patriotism. Did it win Jews rights? Well, not necessarily. Just a moment because there was suspicion. There was suspicion on the part of Napoleon Bonaparte, for example, that the Jews really weren't good citizens. They really wouldn't fight for their country. He called two major assemblies of rabbis and lay Jews, and he asked them, are you willing to fight? Will you violate the Sabbath in order to preserve, you know, the, to fight for the country? And they kept on saying, yes, yes, we will. But um, Napoleon actually punished Jews in the part of France with the largest concentration of Jews with a variety of uh, horrific economic, forms of economic uh, discrimination. So, you know, did military service lead to Jewish emancipation? Not really, but I'll tell you what it did provide. It provided a tremendous sense of Jewish pride. Whether or not their rights were improved because of military service. So here we see the Jewish painter, Moritz Daniel Oppenheim, one of his most famous paintings, the return of the volunteer from the wars of liberation to the family still living in accordance with old customs. So here we see the elderly father with his kippah, the mother gazing lovingly upon her son. The whole family are just absolutely verkhapt with 
the young Jewish soldier who has come back from the wars in his fancy uniform. And look, his brother, his little brother is playing with his sword. He thinks it's so exciting. But what is dad doing? He's looking with great worry at what this man has got around his neck, which is an iron cross. So the fear of assimilation by going into, um, into the military. So if a certain sector then of Jews in Western Europe wanted to serve, here we have a close-up of this painting, they wanted to serve, and the most prominent reform rabbi in mid-19th century Germany, Abraham Geiger, wrote a memorandum to the Prussian king begging him to conscript Jews, saying that military service is the highest religious duty to which all others must be subordinated. And he says that it is a blow to the honor and spirit of Jews not to um, conscript them, and that all Jewish observances can be abrogated in the field of battle, because this is simply required by the modern state. So this is at least what some Jews um, wanted. Now, how accommodated were Jews actually in the army? Well, it depends on the country. In Austria-Hungary, for example, Hasidic Jews could keep their payas. I came across a uh, Yiddish newspaper that says, uh, Soldaten mit payas that in the early 1900s, you had all these Jews from Galicia who were conscripted and they're in their uniforms and they've got pay us and it's not a problem. Um, they were given the Sabbath off whenever possible. If, you know, if it wasn't wartime, they were allowed uh, time off for the holidays. Um, maybe they weren't given kosher meat uh, all the time. They, they, often, they often ate vegetarian diets, but they were treated very well in the Habsburg army. The French army, it was a little different. Um, there was a case in the Crimean War where a Catholic officer and a French officer, a Jewish officer were killed the same day, and the Catholic officer is buried with full Christian rights, and the Jews simply put in the ground. I mean, there's no religious rights whatsoever. And the, the, his fellow soldiers who were, who were Jewish got so upset that they held, they had a minion in their tent with the flap open to expose to the entire, you know, gathered soldiers that they were going to carry out a Jewish um, funeral service. And then the, the French military did open up. And by the 1870s, they were giving furloughs for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur to soldiers for Passover. In fact, if you were from Algeria, which at that time was considered part of France, Jews were given 30 days to go back to Algeria and celebrate um, uh, Passover um, uh, with their holidays. It took a long time to get there and back. But there was a special meaning, this is something I really want to focus on, to the idea not of going home for the holidays, but celebrating them in uniform. Jews took enormous pride in the idea that when in the field, they would, as it were, display or perform their Jewishness by praying while in uniform. Um, it's both a sign of how different they were from their other soldiers, right, they're Jews, but also a sign of how similar they are. They're wearing um, uniforms. So here we see, um, sorry, that's not 1879, that's a typo, is 1870. This is a Christian uh, artist, Kol Nidre in battle. And here we see, uh, this is a depiction of um, Jewish men outside of the Alsatian city, or sorry, it's in Lorraine, the city of Metz, it's Yom Kippur. And uh, they've been allowed to go to an abandoned farmhouse and they've been allowed to hold Yom Kippur services or Kol Nidre services in the farmhouse. But there's a myth that grew that was much grander than this story, which is actually true. This is what this really happened. This is one of the most famous pieces of art in Jewish history. What is it of? A rabbi in German, Germany asked for permission from a German commanding officer for 1,200 Jews to be able to perform a large Yom Kippur service in the field. But it didn't happen. Uh, the Jews were called up to go into um, military, uh, into battle. And so only about 60 Jews were left behind. And they actually went and had that impromptu military service in an abandoned uh, building. But the truth doesn't matter. This tapestry was created shortly after the um, 1870 incident. And the tapestry was widely sold. And it was found in many homes throughout the German, Austrian, Jewish world. So what does it depict? It depicts a rabbi at an ark, soldiers, hundreds, even a thousand soldiers 
The number is 1,200, reminiscent of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Praying together in a valley. Didn't happen. It never happened, but it was a source of such great meaning and pride for the gathered Jews, as was the notion of having chaplains, military chaplains who would guide them. The Austrian Empire was very generous. Uh, the first military chaplains in Europe, Jewish military chaplain, was Hungarian in the 1830s. And from the 1860s, 70s, up through World War I, um, there were Jewish chaplains who actually had an official title and a rank. They had officer's rank of Hauptmann or, or captain. In Germany, it was very different. Uh, they were considered volunteers only, called Feldrabiner, but they were completely volunteer. They had no uh, military rank. It's interesting that the United States, which had far fewer Jews in its military, from the start was much more sympathetic in that there were military chaplains in the United States Army, uh, Jewish military chaplains during the Civil War. Um, and uh, very interestingly, there was even a Jewish military chaplain in the Spanish-American War. Uh, this is Rabbi Joseph Koskopf of Knesset Israel in Chicago. The problem is the war lasted such a short time that by the time he got to Cuba, uh, the war was over. Um, and there were many uh, Jewish chaplains in the United States in World War I. So it's, it's ironic that uh, the United States actually was historically the most accommodating country in terms of Jewish chaplains. So then the Jewish soldier may or may not have been a source of emancipation, but he was a source of pride. For example, this gentleman here, Emil Lehmann, who was a Jewish communal leader in Dresden. In 1848, he describes the revolutionaries of the time. 1848 was a year of revolution. He describes them as Maccabees. Note the term, Maccabees. He urges the Jews fighting for liberty in Germany, follow the colors of the Maccabee. They fought with burning courage for their cherished fatherland, fight as well as yours for Germany. And the term Maccabee was used repeatedly through the whole second half of the 19th century to describe Jewish valor broadly understood, Jewish bravery, Jewish courage. And the reason I highlight this is because um, when the Zionist movement took form in the 1890s, 20th century, the term Maccabee was often applied then, well, literally to the Maccabees, but then to the Jewish pioneer fighters in the land of Israel. But actually, the word Maccabee was used quite often in a non-Zionist context to describe diaspora Jews fighting for their countries. And that notion of celebrating the Jewish fighter, writing newspaper articles about Jews in armies anywhere in the world was throughout the Jewish press in the later 1800s. Here we have a Russian, well, uh, a Polish Jewish newspaper distributed throughout Russia, Hamagid, the major German Jewish newspaper, the major British Jewish newspaper. They reported on Jewish military officers, their promotions, their successes, about the same way that I think Jews maybe in mid 20th century America talked about Jewish scientists, right? They took great pride that, you know, Albert Einstein was Jewish or, the, or Jewish athletes. You know, when I was a child, Sandy Koufax has had, you know, kind of saintly status. There was an era before the Holocaust where the Jews could think of nothing more noble than being an officer fighting for an army wearing a glorious uniform. So for example, the most important Jewish reference work of the early 20th century, the Jewish Encyclopedia, the article on military is one of the longest articles in the encyclopedia. It was written by three of the encyclopedia's chief editors. And it it's amazing, they, they say here, um, I just wanna quote one sentence from this encyclopedia. Um, all terms for virtue among the Greeks and Romans are derived from military prowess, as is the noble man among the Hebrews called Ish Chayel, a man of valor, a man of strength, a warrior. Now, this world that I've been describing tonight no longer exists. That apologetic spirit to show the world how brave, how strong, Jews have been in fighting for their, for their rights. It happened in the United States too, to a lesser extent. Here's a book from 1895, 
largely about the American Jews during the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. It's a very unusual book, though, in that unlike any apologetic book produced in Europe about Jews as soldiers, it has a lot of information on Jews as financiers of war or as quartermasters in armies. That's something European Jews would have felt embarrassed about, about the connection between Jews and money. But Simon Wealth includes it into his book. Um, so what put an end to this notion that there's nothing better than for a Jew to be an army officer? Well, the anti-Semitism of the late 19th century, pogroms in Russia, rising anti-Semitism elsewhere, the rise of Zionism in which the idea shifted from Jews being glorious for fighting and dying for their country to Jews emancipating themselves and fighting to establish a Jewish homeland in the land of Israel. Here we have Chaim Nachman Bialik's highly critical poem of Russian Jews for not doing enough to fight uh, to defend themselves during the Kishinev pogrom of 1903. It's actually not true. The men of Kishinev did fight to defend themselves. Bialik was lying and he knew it, but he wanted to make a point that Jews the world over must become a militant and strong people. And that feeling of admiration that Jews used to have for Jewish soldiers all over the world focused much more on Zionist um, uh, fight, fighters in Palestine, for example, the young men and women of the Haganah, the major Zionist militia. And I think the Holocaust added even more to make ridiculous the idea that Jews would be would be willing to fight and die for countries that had betrayed them. I mean, Poland, Germany, all these countries that betrayed their Jews sent them to their deaths. So the apologetic spirit in the United States, yes, it lived on after World War II. Here's a book that some of you may have actually come across. I know people who read this book as children. Jews fight too, basically showing that, yes, Jews can be strong and brave and so forth. Um, so yes, American Jews had that element, but it was much, much stronger um, in Europe. Uh, who was the new hero if there was an American Jewish military hero? It's someone who fought for Israel like Mickey Marcus, a World War II a hero on both uh, the European and, 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 and Pacific theaters, but who died fighting for Palestine. So with that, I'll stop. And I just want to mention that there's a new biography of Hyman Rickover, um, a Jewish uh, uh, admiral and father of the United States nuclear submarine fleet. And this book just came out in the last few weeks uh, in a series of popular biographies. So the spirit of interest in Jewish military figures continues. So with that, I'll stop, and I very much look forward to your questions. I'll stop my share so I can see people more comfortably, or at least see the um, hosts more comfortably. And, um, okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I am now going to kind of moderate the question and answers, um, although uh, I am having... I just have to say publicly, I'm having a technological issue here. I don't actually see the Q and A uh, oh. available on my screen. Oh, let's um, see. Oh, I see it. Um, so I can. So I do see the questions. But let me start while I'm hoping that the technological people will get the Q and A on on my screen, so I can ask them. I want to ask you one to start off, yeah. and that, of course, is not about the history but about today's current events. Um, what is your take on President Zelensky's uh, leadership in a war? Because, the, because this is really, as best I can tell, outside of Israel. Right. The first time that there has been a Jew who was uh, uh, leading a country uh, uh, there have been heads of state who've been jewish but right. this is a jewish head of state in wartime that's a fascinating question because it's true that you know leon bloom was prime minister of france before and after the war he was in buchenwald during the war uh pierre mendes france was prime minister after the war um or yeah or president sorry no prime minister i always lose track um Benjamin Disraeli of Jewish origin, but did not see Britain through major wars, anything like what's happening here. So you're right. It's a really interesting question. Zelensky's a fascinating figure. 
there's a lot either there's a lot more to him than people thought or he's just a great actor but i think there's a lot to him he's a substantive person who in a time of crisis has drawn on the fact that he is descended from holocaust survivors he is jewish in a very strong ethnic way that ukrainian and, and russian jews are i mean he's not observant he's married to a non-jewish woman in fact when rabbi bleich the um chief rabbi of uh, Ukraine was asked, you know, is Zelensky married to a Jew? Or is she Jewish? And he, he said, not yet. Um, <laughs> he's not observant. Uh, he, I don't believe he's been to Israel. He was offered an opportunity to study in Israel, which he turned down when he was young. I mean, he's, but he's very, when you live in Russia or Ukraine, if you're Jewish, you cannot deny it. I mean, he's Jewish. Um, was it important to him before the war? I don't know. But clearly, he has displayed tremendous fortitude, and we see him in his battle fatigues and in his olive drab t-shirts. And yes, he's a he's an a performer, and he's performing a role. But I think he means it. Now, the real interesting question then is the response, because Jews the world over. I mean, the Jewish Forward, the Jewish Chronicle of London, the Jewish press throughout the world has been very, very ad, admiring of him. Um, and writing about him, and the Jewish Chronicle had had a story just last week, the 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 Jewish Maccabee of our age. And so far as I know, this is the first time the term Maccabee has been applied since 1948 to a public Jewish figure who is not Israeli. That is, Israel sucked up the, as it were, the attention of Jews in celebrating Jewish military valor, and now we have. Zelensky, who's not a warrior himself, I mean, he's a politician, but he's showing military courage, and they're using the term Maccabee again. So it's, a, it's an interesting kind of throwback to the 19th century uh, celebration. And yes, there's an apologetic element to it, I mean, pride, but I don't think that Jews today are saying, because Zelensky is a courageous man, this will defeat anti-Semites. Because Zelensky is a courageous man, he can try to stand up to Russia, which is not easy. But I don't think it's an apologetic in quite the older sense of trying to somehow win rights, emancipation, um, put an end to anti-Semitism. I think we know now that anti-Semites are going to think what they want, regardless of what we say. Anyway, it's a great question. Okay, so, so I have two. one comment. Someone yeah. points out that uh, Joseph Krauskopf was actually at KI in Philadelphia, not Chicago. Mm. And ah, so okay. being, being that you're at a Philadelphia school and Sorry about that. in fact, KI is just down the street from Gratz College and across the street from uh, where Rabbi Landis uh, ah. was the rabbi. And the rabbi at KI was also an admiral and a uh, uh, head of the Naval Clergy Corps as well, uh, the, the, the Jewish historian, uh, Rabbi Korn. Uh, right. So move Krauskopf back to Philadelphia and we'll love you. Okay, I will change the slide, I promise. But the question is, what of the consequence of Jews of one country killing Jews of other countries? It's a great question. And if I can make a brief plug, it's the subject of a whole chapter in that book that I published about 10 years ago. Um, about which um, uh, Chancellor Finkelman has spoken so, so nicely. Um, there are stories that go back, if not earlier than to the 1850s, about Jews killing other Jews in battle. Actually, 1848, the, I think the first I found these stories are in the 1840s. No, even earlier, sorry. In the, the Napoleonic Sanhedrin, so it's you know 1807, the French Jews say to Napoleon, we are so patriotic, we love our country so much that we're willing to go into battle knowing that there might very well be Jews on the other side. So that's already at the beginning of the 1800s. And then you begin to see it show up in rabbinic sermons in the 1840s and the 1850s. And there's particularly a story that you may have heard, a story about a Jew in battle, and he either fires his gun and kills another person, who then turns out to be Jewish. He riffles through his things and finds a, a tefillin or something. Or is about to shoot the person who then calls out the Shema Yisrael and then realizes that the person he's about to kill is Jewish and puts down his gun. 
These stories began to circulate throughout Europe in the 1850s, 60s, 70s. I found the first version of it was by a man named Pontemoli, Pontemoli an Italian ser uh, sermon. And then in World War I, they began to skyrocket. Stories everywhere, Eastern Front, Western Front, about a Jew who kills another Jew, a Jew who's about to kill someone who turns out to be Jewish, whatever. I don't know if any of these stories are true. I mean, think about it. There were uh, 11 million casualties, just deaths alone in World War I. You think about the, the number of people conscripted in World War I on both sides, the odds of a Jewish soldier killing another Jewish soldier, maybe on the Eastern Front, you know, Russia versus Austria, because he had lots of Jews on both sides. But the odds are pretty low. Um, but it's, it haunts people. It, it, it worries them. Um, and it's something that they continue to worry about. In fact, Shaul Chernochovsky, the great Hebrew poet, had a whole poem about it, about two brothers who go off to war. Um, one fights for Greece and one fights for the Ottoman Empire in a war they fought over, Greece, uh, over Crete in the late 18, uh, 1890s, and one kills the other. So it's not the question of whether it really happened. It's the question of the haunting idea of a Jew killing another one. And it stayed around through World War I. It didn't appear in World War II for obvious reasons. You didn't really have to worry too much about killing Jews. So, so speaking of World War I, we have a question about if you could talk a little about Jews in the German army in World War I. And one of the questions is, is it true that Corporal Hitler had a Jewish lieutenant who he respected? Yes, yes. Her, Hitler's field commander was Jewish, who actually pinned, uh, I forget the name, but it was an Iron Cross. He got a, a, a kind of common decoration for valor in battle because Hitler was running between the trenches and the communication lines. And he showed valor in battle and he was given a field uh, medal and it was pinned on his chest by this Jewish individual whose name I forget and who moved to London after the war and didn't like to talk about it. Um, so it's true. And, uh, but there were Jews in the German army. They served more or less in proportion to their population during the war. Jews on average were a little older than non-Jews in Germany, but they served. About 100,000 Jews uh, served in the German army in World War I, and about 12,000 died. And the anti-Semitism after World War I was so horrific, saying that Jews hadn't fought, they had been cowards. The German government had even commissioned a census during the war it's kind of like looking for voting fraud. I mean, like determined to find that Jews were not fighting when in fact what the census came up with was that the Jews were actually serving exactly as they should be. So the government simply didn't publish the census because it didn't give them the numbers that they wanted. They, they couldn't find what they were looking for. And it's actually very sad because during the 20s and 30s as anti-Semitism in Hitler's Germany increased after 1933, Jewish veterans, published all kinds of apologetic works about how they had suffered and how they had fought and how 12,000 of them had died. But of course, it had no effect on the Nazis. The Nazis would just say, it's not true. You present them with facts and they just say, it's not true. So it's, it's, it's a tragic story. Um, but yes, Germans, German Jews fought as patriotic Germans. And I have a chapter in the book where I deal with this, the diaries they kept, the, 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 um, Memoirs they wrote after the war, it's heartbreaking. They, they were fighting for their country. So one question here is, uh, isn't Trotsky Jewish? And Bron he Lev was the sure. organizer of the first Soviet army, correct? Yeah, Lev Bronstein. You know, there's a joke that the Trotskys commit the crimes and the Bronsteins pay the price. Uh, because Trotsky was a, you know, taken name. He took the name of one of his prison guards. Um, I don't, and I'm not a Trotsky expert, but he had organizational genius, including military organizational genius. And he was the commander of the Red Army uh, and very successful. So that really leads the question about what do we mean by Jews in the military? Do we mean anybody of Jewish origin? Because you're right, Trotsky was of Jewish origin. But he disassociated himself from that. And he never, I mean, his, his military action was never done in the name of defending Jews, promoting Jewish rights, none of that. What I've been talking about tonight is Jews who engage in military action or who praise Jews in military action in order to help the Jews as a collective. And of course, Trotsky was very far from that. And so just a quick follow-up on that. Um, 
in World War II, uh, there are a significant number of Jewish generals and admirals in the Soviet army. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can, you, can you tell us a little about that? Because I think it surprises well, people. Yeah, there were about 200. Um, I th you know, there were, I forget now if the number was 25 or so Jewish generals and admirals in, uh, and, uh, in World War II. Remember that to be a, it's a funny thing. There are, there's a whole genre of apologetic literature about Jewish generals. You, you can be an important figure in the military and not be a general. It's like, you don't have to be at the top of the command chain to be important. Mickey Marcus was only a colonel. He was really important, but it is true that there were a couple of hundred Soviet Jewish generals and admirals. It tells you something about the Red Army that despite anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union, it was a meritocracy. And after World War I, the Soviet Union lost huge reservoirs of talent. A lot of people were killed. Anybody who was reactionary, monarchist, was either killed or went into exile. And a lot of them had been the military command, the aristocrats had been the military commanders, gone. Ethnic Germans had formed the pillar of the Russian bureaucracy, and a lot of them were military officers, gone. So what do you need? You need people who are educated to be especially a seat, to be a commanding officer you know, at a middling or senior level. Educated, you have to be capacity for abstract thought. It helps to be multilingual. Jews flocked to the officer training schools and the military academies as soon as they could after 1917. They were prominent in the Red Army from the very beginning. And then in World War II, all the more so. So we are almost out of time. And uh, I wonder if you, um, oh, I have another question here. Um, as a boy, I heard stories of Russian Jews going to great lengths to avoid conscription and during the Russo-Japanese War and of Jews as young as eight or nine being drafted. Uh, can you comment? Well, that's an interesting memory because it combines about a century or more. I mean, it is true that in the early 1800s, about 1830s, uh, Jews were commanded to hand over a certain percentage of, of young Jews in their community every year to the military. And what they would do is they would make sure not to choose the children of anybody influential, wealthy, or learned. So the rabbi's kids, the business person's kids, they were spared. So they would take the flotsam and jetsam of the community, the poorest kids. And rather than take somebody who was of, let's say, 15, 16, 17, 18, who was already married and getting ready to have kids, they would pick sometimes children as young as 12 or even younger. So this was actually done by the Jewish community. They would make these choices. It wasn't the Russians who were choosing the children. It was the Jewish community. So that was a source of great anger within Jewish communities in Russia. Uh, Jewish communities would also send basically Jewish thugs, known as hoppers, to uh, kidnap boys who'd run away so that they wouldn't be recruited or forced into, into the military. But that practice stopped. It stopped in 1855. Done. And by the 1870s, Russia actually had a fairly normal universal conscription. It was a six-year term, which sounds awful, but it had been 25 years before that, which is a death sentence. So for your relatives at the time of the Sino-Japanese War, uh, sorry, the Russo-Japanese War, by, by that time, that world of eight, nine, 10 year olds or whatever is ancient history. But it is true that there were Jews who tried to get out of serving in the Russian military. But as I argue, and you know, anti-Semites will never listen, there was nothing unusual about this behavior. It was common to people throughout the Russian Empire and the Austrian Empire that they would try to get out of bribing people and trying to fail the medical, physical, or whatever. So yes, it was common, and it did happen during the um, uh, during the Russo-Japanese War. But there were plenty of Jews, and I've got a colleague who's himself Russian. If I want to recommend another book about Jews in the military, Yochanan Petrovsky Stern at Northwestern University has written an amazing book called Jews in the Russian Army. And he argues, and I don't totally agree with him, he argues that Jews, in fact, were far less likely to dodge the draft in Russia than other uh, groups. Um, and you know, the book is about one story after another about Russian valor in, uh, in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78, in the, in, in the Russo-Japanese uh, War, and so on. So the last question that I have coming from our audience is, uh, 
the story that I suspect many people have in their family that my, in this case, my, my step grandfather left Russia with his brother uh, in uh, 1913 to avoid the military service. And so is that also true? Or is that a, is that kind of an urban legend among Jews that we are descended from Russian draft dodgers? You know, it's a funny thing. When I started working on this book and I would tell my friends what I'm working on, one response I got is, oh, you're writing a history of Jewish draft dodgers. And the problem is this, about a third of the Jews in the Russian empire left between 1880 and 1914. Two thirds stayed. Okay, a third left. Most of them wound up in the Naya Welt. They wound up in North America. A lot wound up in Western Europe. Some went to Latin America. Okay, so we're their descendants. And yeah, they left for all kinds of reasons. They left because they didn't want to go into the military. They left because they were poor. They left because of pogroms. They left for lots of reasons. Maybe there's more yichis in saying that you left because you were evading the draft as opposed to saying that you were poor. I don't know. But I do know that in Austria, where the Jews were much less persecuted, but they were still very poor in parts of Eastern Austria, their emigration rates to the US were the same as Russia. And they didn't have pogroms and they and, and the army wasn't as frightening for them. I mean, you know, they let them have their payas and they they treated them well and so forth. I'm sure there's some truth to it. I'm sure. But just remember, we're descended from the one third who left. There's the two thirds who stayed. And what happened to them? They became Soviet Jews and they became proud soldiers in the Red Army. And 200 of them became generals and admirals in the Second World War. And to this day, the ones who are alive wear their medals and ribbons on Victory in Europe Day and parade down the streets of Tel Aviv or Holon or wherever they happened or, or, or uh, Brighton Beach, right, wherever they happen to live. So that's a very different attitude than fleeing the draft. They're very proud of their military service in what they call the Great Patriotic War. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating and wonderful. And I think we've all learned a great deal. And I appreciate your uh, coming all the way from Cambridge uh, by Zoom to, to join us tonight. Again, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. I'd like to uh, second those remarks, uh, Dr. Finkelman, uh, and thank you again, uh, Dr. Pensler, for teaching and engaging with us tonight. It's really been an honor. i uh, also like to thank all of you, uh, all 100 or so of you uh, who joined us tonight um, for participating and uh, uh, sharing your, your interesting questions. Um, so thank you. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that in a few days, we will be emailing a link uh, to the recording to everybody who's registered. Uh, but just in a few minutes, you will receive an email from us uh, with links to access recordings from the last two Landis lectures, uh, and uh, as well as a very brief survey. It will just take a quick minute of your time to complete this, and we really will appreciate your feedback on the survey. Uh, so thank you again to the Landis family um, uh, for making the gift that made this lecture series possible. We're going to have a quick moment to, of appreciation for the Landis family and thank you to, um, to the family for providing this, um, uh, these words of, of memory and honor for Rabbi Ad Admiral Aaron Landis. Um, so it is really, a, it is an honor for Gratz to, to honor his memory. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, so with that, I would like to wish you all a good night, be well, and hope to see you again soon. We have many more programs coming uh, in the coming weeks. So please check out uh, our website, subscribe to our newsletter and stay plugged in. Thank you. Have a good night.